Good morning, everybody. Oh, we are totally awake. Y'all are totally awake. I'm not. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about if we're there yet. Who has totally arrived at the DevOps? Oh, I saw a hand. That's amazing. Do you want to come up here? <laughs> because it's tough, right? So we're going to talk about if we're there yet. And we'll start a little bit on like why I'm even talking about this. Has anyone here heard of the State of DevOps report or read it? Who here has taken the survey? The State of Dev I love you so hard. Thanks. So I am the lead investigator on the State of DevOps report. I work on this with the team at Dora, so Gene Kim, Jez Humble, also the team at Puppet. We've been running this for the last four years. We've got over 23,000 data points around the world, dozens of industries, over 2,000 companies, companies large and small, which is my really, really nice way of saying there's no excuses. <laughs> I also work at Dora, which is DevOps Research and Assessment, and we work with companies to help them measure and benchmark and identify the key things they need to do to really accelerate this journey that they're on, whether you want to call it a DevOps transformation or a technology transformation or a digital transformation or whatever like fancy word someone's going to use that doesn't make them like cringe, right? To help us make software better. And so I see the data in small companies and also in mass, right? And in in large trends. So hopefully that, that gives me at least some really solid insights into what really makes a difference. And so here's what we're gonna be talking about today. It really is, it's all about the signposts and where we wanna go. And so I'll start by talking about how DevOps really is a direction and not a destination, and what I mean by that. Identifying your own DevOps direction moving along your journey and what it looks like for you and making sure we know kind of what that North Star is so that we don't get too discouraged along the way. We can kind of pull our own teams along, checking our progress and what measures we should be talking about because I don't know if you know, I really like data and I dig metrics. So of course any talk I give is gonna talk about data. So first of all, let's get us started off on the right note. <laughs> Maturity models are for chunks. Who here has played World of Warcraft? Who here has heard of World of Warcraft? Fantastic. So here's what I mean when I'm talking about maturity models. Of, actually, who here works at a company or has a friend who works at a company who wants to have a maturity model? Everybody, no? Should I skip this part? Do we want to hear this rant? This is my favorite rant. Are we okay with this rant? Let's rant. It's a morning. Okay, who doesn't, who doesn't want to start a morning with coffee and a rant? Maturity models are for chumps. So this, this is World of Warcraft circa, when did it first come out? I think it was like 2004, 2005, something like that. This was the world of World of Warcraft, right? We have two lands. This is the land, this is the world. And when this first came out, you could only get to level 60. I may know this. <laughs> I mean data, right? So if we had created a maturity model back then, and your mage or your warlock was gonna be pimped out, like, like tricked out, tricked out, you could only get to level 60. And so let's say we create a maturity model. Level 40 is good, level 50 is great, and level 60 is like the, right? That is as good as you get. Okay, but that's like back then, and I sort of had to stop playing World of Warcraft because I wanted to finish my PhD. <laughs> Fast forward a few years, and the world has changed. We have different, we have extra land now. We have additional technology. There are extra pets. There's extra gear. There's extra stuff we can play with. 
And there's extra, now we can be like level 110. So the maturity model we created back in the day is completely out of date. So our maturity model is like, that's, that's cute. That's adorable. Also, it's totally bunk. That's a problem because now if we've created a maturity model for ourselves and we actually set goals based on that maturity model, once we reach that level, we no longer dedicate resources to it. Those resources can be money, and people usually just think about money, but it can be money, it can be time. Most importantly, it can be attention. What happens if we reach magical level four or five, and someone decides, oh, we have arrived at the World of Warcraft, or we have arrived at the DevOps, and now we're done? What happens if an executive decides we've arrived, and now we're done on our transformation journey? Um, that sucks. Because except for the one person who says they've arrived at the DevOps, that's a challenge, right? Like, that's bad, bad news. So instead of picking a destination, what if instead we pick a direction? And that direction is we need to remain competitive. We need to continue delivering value for our customers. Whatever the world looks like, whatever the technology landscape looks like, whatever our competitors are able to deliver, we need to remain competitive and we need to be able to deliver value for our customers. What if that is what we do? Okay, so it's a direction and not a destination and we should follow a continuous improvement paradigm. Does that sound reasonable? Because 10 years ago, right, like Docker, Docker, Docker wasn't really a thing. <laughs> so now it's a direction. And then like, okay, so which direction? So let's start with kind of a basic definition then. If DevOps is then the use of technology, process, and culture to deliver value, does that seem reasonable? It's a handful of things. Because it's not just technology. Because if it's just technology, that's like the 80s and 90s when we were just buying technology and checking off a box and walking away. And technology wasn't actually getting us anywhere. Right, that's when technology was a cost center. Who here's heard that? <laughs> Who here's heard that way too many times? For sure. That's when technology didn't work, honestly. So it needs to be tech and some process and some culture, right? That's like our, our special magical like, set of things that we have found works. The research shows that's our, that, by the way, that's the Nicole drinking game. Research shows drink. So, and by the way, I found this, like someone's had this amazing tweet where it says, if a speaker or someone says research shows and they don't cite it, they're full of it. Okay, so state of DevOps reports for the four years, that's good evidence. Research from Eric Brynjolfsson out of MIT shows it, and research from Besser out of Boston University shows it as well, and that just came out in 2017. So I'm happy to provide like speaker notes if you want uh, stuff on that. So the next question I often get is, is there one metric that matters? Mm, well, no, sorry. But if you want to pick one, this would be the one I would pick. And it's because this is going to be the one thing of like, what's your DevOps that is predictive of organizational performance, where org performance is productivity, profitability, market share, as well as effectiveness, efficiency, customer satisfaction. So this would be the one thing I would point towards because this is going to be your key value driver and differentiator. So IT performance or software delivery performance, if that's a better word for you, this is where you can develop and deliver software with both speed and stability. So let's pick that apart. I'm gonna say this a lot. Develop and deliver software. That sounds like DevOps, right? Develop, dev, and deliver, ops, software, with both speed and stability. The cool thing we found is that these two go together, speed and stability. For the longest time, we always thought, or we were told, or it was whispered in dark, dark alleys, right? <clears throat> I tell, maybe, told us that, that we, <laughs> that we had to slow down in order to get stability. Four years of data, over 23,000 data points tell me that doesn't happen. The high performers get it all. Mm, high performers? A few people are like making this face like, high performers, what do you mean high performers? How do you do this, Nicole? So I grabbed this data. Um, speed, deploy frequency, lead time for changes, code commit to code deploy. Stability measures, MTTR and change fail rate. I take all this data, and because maturity models are for the chumps, or for chumps, right, I don't like a priori decide what my levels are. 
I take this data and I want to know what the industry is doing. So I like throw it in the hopper. And I say, what are my cut points? What's the industry doing? What's the industry doing? And all four measures hang out at the top, and they kind of it's called a cluster analysis. So they group together, they cluster together in like awesomeness. And then there's a big gap. And then they cluster together in the middle. And then there's a big gap, and they cluster together at the bottom. So all of these teams are doing like awesome or like mediocre or like <laughs> they all suck. Because I'm super creative, I call them high performers and medium performers and low performers. But I see that all the time. So the high performers are like killing it at everything. And the low performers suck at everything, and the medium performers are hanging out in the middle. So I don't see these trade-offs. And here's, here's what I see. When I compare the high performers and the low performers, high performers see 46 times more frequent code deployments. Okay, that's the difference between multiple times per day and once a week or less. This is what we mean when we say we can delight our customers, we can pivot when we need to pivot, we can experiment. Also, faster lead time from code commit to code deploy. That's getting code through our pipeline in an hour or more than a week. Some people are like, a week, that's great. That's better than I'm doing now. Yeah, but if I can do it in an hour, what if I need to patch my code? This is also infrastructure. Okay, this isn't just devs. Upside of the house, right? Infrastructure is code. This makes, this makes it so that when we need to push code, it's easy and it's boring and it's uneventful. Okay, so let's look at the stability side. 96 times faster MTTR. High performers recover in less than an hour instead of several days. Okay, so that still makes me cringe a little bit because who goes down for several days? Mm. That's painful, right? Like, that's scary. This is 2017. We should not be going down for several days. We're also, high performers are one-fifth as likely that changes will fail. And when those changes do fail, they're very small. They're very isolated. We have a very small blast radius. High performers are, are failing at like the one, two, maybe 5% mark. On average, it's seven and a half, but they're, they're really kind of at that, at that low point. Um, low performers are around like 38 and a half percent. And when they do, they're part of larger code, code pushes, right? So it's hard to isolate what that failure really is, which is why it takes so long to recover. This is, an eye, this is my favorite eye chart, sorry. It's an eye chart. It's found in the 2017 State of DevOps report. So here's what we're trying to look for. The high performers are maximizing all items. They can deploy on demand. Lead time for changes is less than an hour. MTTR is less than an hour. Change fail rate is again between zero and 15%, but, but it comes in much lower. Low performers deploy. Uh, median is between once a week and once a month, but on average is closer to once a month. Lead time for changes between uh, one week and one month, but on average is at one month. MTTR between a day and a week on average is uh, closer to a week. Change fail rate between 31 and 45%. So you can look at that and think about where your team falls. Okay, so when we look at that, is this the DevOps journey, right? Is it all up and to the right? As we go from low to medium to high performance, are we going from low speed, stability, innovation? Oh, by the way, retention too. This is also predictive of like the, ha the happy employees and hiring. Those numbers look like it's going from like, uh, we're going up and to the right, right? That's what it looks like. Is that what it feels like though? That's not what it feels like. So what it actually feels like is, has anyone here heard of the J curve? Where we actually like start, yay, this is awesome. And we're like, no, this, this is awful. Oh, sh right. And then we can kind of dig out and it starts getting better. So how do we reconcile these two things where some of the data shows like up and to the right, but the, the feels are, <laughs> we have the quick wins and then it like looks crazy and then it gets better. We actually have evidence of the J curve in some of the data. So in the 2016 State of DevOps report, we see evidence in unplanned work. Where the medium performers actually have more so they are definitely developing and delivering code with more speed and stability. 
but they have some unplanned work. This makes sense, right? We think this makes sense because there could be this thing where we start on our journey and it looks like we may be uncovering some technical debt, maybe, right, as we hit more complexity. We definitely see this as we look at manual work, right? Medium performers, if you look at um, manual work for deployments and manual work for change processes, medium performers have significantly more manual work in those stages. Again, as we start on our transformation, we start unpacking more of this technical complexity. Has anyone here hit any of that? Yeah, right, so we've hit some of this. Okay, so can both be true? Possibly. <laughs> Both can be true. So how do we work along this path? And why do we care? Maybe we should just hang out and be a low performer. I don't want to hit that dip. I don't want to hit that pain. But here's why. High performing organizations are twice as likely to meet or exceed their goals in productivity, profitability, and market share they're also twice as likely to achieve or exceed goals that are non-commercial, right? Because, don't get me wrong, I love me some money. <laughs> but it's not just about the money. Right? We also care about effectiveness, efficiency, delivering for our stakeholders, delivering for our customers. The commercial goals we've found evidence for four years in a row. We also added non-commercial goals in the latest State of DevOps report, and these hold for both nonprofits, governments, educationals, um, but also for the for-profit firms, because even if we're at a for-profit firm, we care about things like effectiveness and efficiency and taking care of our customers, right? So we find this as well. So we also find evidence that as we're like doing the DevOps, we can scale our code deployments and we can scale our uh, developers. It looks like we can maybe break through this mythical man month, and here's why. So as we take a look at this graph, um, on the left is deploys per day, and on the bottom is number of developers. Here's what we see. Low performers, as we start adding more people to a project, like, has anyone worked on a project where they're like, we're behind schedule, let's add people. <laughs> I've maybe been on these projects, and we're like, please, anything but that, no. And we're like, I will find something for these people to do, except touch my code. <laughs> I'm sure it's gonna be fine. I'm sure no one here's ever done that, I'll just say I've done this. Okay, and then medium performers. If we have a reasonable cadence going, right, we have pretty good processes, we have reasonable um, automation, we've got a pretty good culture. If you add more people and you're at a pretty good point in the project, it's kind of gonna work. Has anyone here been on those projects? It's kind of okay? Okay, now in the highest performing organizations, and we see evidence of this, and now we've seen it in the data, you can actually add more people. Now this is a, this is a we collected the data on a log, um, on a log scale, so this is actually linear. You can add people and it actually increases your throughput. Which is, that's dope. <laughs> this is amazing. Okay, so maybe it's worth it. So maybe we can go ahead and hit that little trough of despair, and if, but like, let's speed through it, right? Let's find ways to accelerate through that and see what happens. Okay, so these are our signposts, right? IT performance is our direction, developing and delivering code with speed and stability. Okay, and we know that it's like moving in tandem is possible. Watch for sustained trade-offs, right? Like sustained trade-offs are bad news. You shouldn't have trade-offs. Maybe like for just a little bit of time. Okay, the waste work is gonna be your detours, right? So look for unplanned work, manual work, look for quality proxies. These are gonna be really specific to your context. Um, defect incidents, security remediation, look for stuff like that. These are gonna help you judge the depth and the breadth of your J curve, right? How far are you crashing and how, how long is that lasting? One final important, super important check though, is it sustainable? Look for deploy pain, look for burnout. The investments in your technical processes and your, your DevOps processes are actually going to pay off in sustainability as well. So Diego Almeida gave a talk at DevOps Days London showing that um, their work-life scores before investing in DevOps were about 38%, and after they invested in their DevOps processes, shot up to 75%. So not only did it make their delivery better, it made like, the, the work life better, which I think is just as important. Okay, 
So how do we move, how do we go, how do we go from low to medium to high performance? <laughs> we don't just decide to go there. One does not simply walk into high performance. Here's how we get there. We know key capabilities that drive IT performance in a statistically significant way. They fall into four categories. Tech and automation. I'm just gonna read these, we're gonna race. Version control, deployment automation. These are probably familiar, right? Hopefully, like, we've heard of these, yes? Continuous integration, trunk-based development, test automation, test data management, shifting left on security, so integrating the, our security folks early and not just like pen testing and YOLOing it when we fail. <laughs> um, doing continuous delivery, having a loosely coupled architecture, and architecting for empowering teams. These are all of the things that we have found to be statistically significant at driving improvement and our ability to develop and deliver software with speed and stability. So um, we always kind of iterate on our research program every year. So we'll be looking at more things this year. In terms of process, gathering and implementing customer feedback, working in small batches, having a lightweight change approval process, and having team experimentation. Um, so a good example out of Capital One that kind of combines these two, uh, we did some work with them, and they found that by focusing on two key things for them, which was the change approval process and trunk-based development, they were able to see a 20x increase in their release frequency in only two months with zero increase in incidents. Right, so by focusing on just the right work, they can really accelerate through their transformation. Okay, measurement and monitoring. Visual management, monitoring for business decisions, checking system health proactively. So like, let's not find out about failures on Twitter. Um, <laughs> using whip limits and visualizations. So this also happens to come out of Capital One. They use Hygieia, and it's great because it's open source. Right, so it's a monitoring solution, it's also a visualization solution, right? It's dashboards that everyone can see. Culture, so a Western organizational culture, it's a particular measure of org culture that is really, it's a really nice proxy for uh, DevOps culture. It's a way we measure it. Um, having a climate for learning where learning is seen as an investment and not an expense. Um, making work meaningful and collaboration among teams, also transformational leadership. Um, so, Western organizational culture. Has anyone here not heard of this? Oh, lots. Okay. So, we measured this um, because it was it was so it was um, first proposed by a sociologist named Ron Westrom. He used it because it was very predictive of high risk, complex systems like healthcare, aviation, nuclear power. And when we read through it, we realized this is a really good measure for things like DevOps, right? Because when we talk about DevOps, we talk about things like breaking down silos, right? So uh, bridging's encouraged. Also um, innovation, novelty is implemented or novelty is crushed. Um, we want to learn from our failures and have blameless postmortems. So failure leads to inquiry. We realized this was gonna be a really good way to measure it. So who here has a friend that might work in a pathological organization? <laughs> Across our data, we tend to see, um, I wanna say it's about 33% that fall into pathological, and it tends to be highly, highly correlated with um, low-performing teams, or yeah, low-performance teams. Who here has a friend that might work in a bureaucratic organization? Okay, uh, this, about 55% of our data falls into this category, and it's highly, highly correlated with medium performance teams. Uh, for a generative culture, who here has a friend or is lucky enough to work in a generative team, performance-oriented team, okay? Um, when we look at our data, uh, I wanna say 25% fall into this category, and it's highly correlated with high-performance teams. Uh, this is highly predictive of IT performance, that ability to develop and deliver software with speed and stability. It's also highly correlated with organizational performance. Um, so NASA's teams, uh, we know that organizational culture ends up being very uh, telling about how well we make our technology. So NASA has found that as well. The Mars rover team ended up being um, very, 
see, not matrix, opposite of matrix, they really kind of had a DevOps environment, right? So at the end of their meetings, they would go around in a circle and they would say, I am happy. They had to say, I am happy. Um, Curiosity was only supposed to live about six months. It lived several, several years. You contrast that to, to Cassini, and Cassini was the one that went around Jupiter. They were highly matrixed. Every single team had their very own instrument. If you wanted to take a picture or a measurement from the planet, you had to like physically move the robot. Anytime the team started fighting, Cassini started breaking. Now imagine the impact that our team's culture has on our technology when we're like a few feet away from it and not thousands and thousands of <laughs> miles and miles and miles away. So the hard part is prioritizing work. Um, the quick wins part of the J-curve makes it easy to figure this out when we're early on in our journey. It gets more difficult as we go. So where should we start? The answer is always it depends. Everyone is different. These are the patterns that I see, okay? Architecture is the highest contributor to continuous delivery based on the data that we collected in 2017. It shows up for very many teams when Dora does our assessments. Um, here it shows up as the need for a loosely coupled architecture or trunk-based development. Those are um, two that show up very often. Another one that shows up as a constraint and a blocker almost every time we run the assessment is having a lightweight change approval process, right? So automating that or adopting a risk-based approach works. Also, uh, continuous integration and its full component shows up. But make sure that you really assess your own environment to see what's most important. Um, so what should you do? do? Uh, what should you do? Identify your constraints. Pick just a handful, right? Death by initiative is very real. I've worked with some organizations where I walk in, they have 50 initiatives. <laughs> Gonna be a little tough. <laughs> Pick a handful, start. Um, eliminate those constraints, reevaluate, rinse and repeat. Because again, maturity models are gonna be tough, right? Pick what you wanna do, move along that curve, and then make sure we're measuring the right things. We want to be measuring here, uh, both system and survey metrics. This takes time, so we wanna start now. Full system instrumentation can take sometimes two to three years if we haven't started. Um, survey measures can give us a good pulse into our system where we are now, so why not collect both? So some good types of measures we can collect, data about systems and process from the systems themselves, right, the data that we get out of our systems, data about systems and process from people, and anytime we wanna collect data about people like culture, we should always be collecting that from the people themselves. So um, quick hit. Data about systems and process from systems. This is great for precision, continuous data, right? It can give us data about like responses in milliseconds, seconds, don't ask people about this. We're really bad at this. Specific data, volume and scale. This data is not good for a holistic view of our system. It's really difficult to collect all of the data from all of the pieces and then pull it together and correlate it. Um, it's tricky to capture drifts in system data, right? If, if something shifts and we don't know that maybe a configuration has changed, um, capturing behavior outside of the system is difficult. Good example here is version control. My version control system can tell me what's in version control. It can't tell me what's not in version control, right? If I'm, if I'm not putting something in version control, my system can't tell me that. It's not good for cultural <laughs> perceptual measures. Uh, collecting data from surveys uh, is good for accuracy. It's really great for a holistic view of the system. It's fantastic for triangulation with system data. My system data tells me one thing and my people tell me something different. That doesn't mean people are lying. It tells me that something's off. It could tell me that my configuration's off. It could tell me that something's being missed in my system data. Uh, this is really good for capturing behavior outside the system. My people will tell me if maybe there's an entire set of system data that's not hitting version control. Um, it's good for perceptual me measures related to the system like that deploy pane or those burnout measures. This data is not good for precision like I just mentioned. It's not good for continuous data, right? Survey fatigue is a thing. If you're gonna do a 20 minute survey, don't do it every single week. Don't do it every single month. Space those out. Um, so here's some examples. One or two system metrics might tell us that our deployment pipeline looks like this. Isn't that beautiful? It's a nice, it's a nice deployment pipeline. It's fully connected. Our train goes all the way through the tracks in the system. More complete system instrumentation might tell us that it looks like this. <laughs> it's automated. 
It works. I don't know what your problem is. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Just don't introduce like any stresses to the system. Now our people, our people might tell us that it's a little closer to this. It's, I mean, the train is moving down the tracks. I'm deploying code. I'm pushing code. Everything is still working. It's fantastic. I'm still getting code out the door. I'm on schedule. It might be Friday at five, <laughs> but it's totally fine. As long as you really have the right person on schedule, Friday at five. <laughs> this is why we want to have system metrics that let me know what's happening. And we want to ask people also what the actual deployment process is like. Because without that quick check, we might not know, right? So a real world example came from uh, the folks at Capital One. They talked about using both Hygieia because they could collect data real time continuous and uh, they did work with Dora because it gave them some additional insights to, to look at a few key pieces to really beef up their uh, DevOps capabilities. So also data about people from people. If you're gonna capture cultural measures, don't get it out of your HR systems. It's not going to tell you the same thing. And at best case, even if it does, it's going to be a lagging measure. If you're only looking at turnover, you're capturing that after people have already left. And don't you want to keep them? OK, by the way, employees in high performing organizations are 2.2 times more likely to refer their organization as a great place to work. Who here is working for a company or a team that's trying to hire? Like all the hands. <laughs> Everyone, right? It's super important right now. Uh, dimensions of transformational leadership, I'm gonna have to race through quick, take a picture. We found that transformational leaders, which by the way, doesn't just have to be someone with direct reports. Leaders are important to bolster the work of the teams around them. It ends up being an amplifier and a supporter for all of the technical work that we do and also all the process work that we do, which makes sense, right? If we work in organizations with amazing leaders, we tend to do better. So by the way, leadership is also necessary but not sufficient. Teams with the least transformational leaders were one half as likely to be high IT performers. That probably also resonates, right? If you're on a team with a leader that's like, it's really tough to get your work done. But on the flip side, leaders can't do it alone. Teams with like the very, very, very most amazing, amazing leaders were no better than the median because the leaders aren't the ones doing the work. We're the ones doing the work. The leaders can bolster and amplify our efforts, but they aren't the ones doing it. We need them to help us to write air cover, to give us the resources that we need, but they aren't the ones doing it. Okay, so what can we do here? For the metrics part, read and share data driven. It's a fantastic short book written by DJ Patel and Hillary Mason. We can ask others about the metrics that are happening in our own organizations. Think about our own metrics and signposts. How do we know where we're going? How do we know what's important? Think about what influences our own IT performance. How are we doing in terms of technology and automation? How are we doing in terms of our process? How are we doing in terms of our culture? Think about measuring um, both our direction and our waste work, right? Our direction and our detours. <laughs> So this is what we've talked about. We talked about direction and our destination, moving, moving along our journey, checking our progress, and our measures. For more metrics and data, you can go check out um, our website. We've got our ROI white paper, which is just a free sign up. We've got case studies. We have all of our peer review research. All of that's open source. Um, you can learn about assessment. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.